All right, Matt. Welcome to the Eighth Lane Podcast. Um, I read an article from Outside Magazine on you where they described you as the modern day Indiana Jones. And I think that's probably a really fitting way of describing who you are. Um, do you want to just give us a brief introduction on who you are, kind of what you stand for, what you do? Sure. Well, my my name is Matt Gallon. I was born in Provo, Utah. Mm. Uh, and so the playground that I was born onto probably, you know, helped shape my life and form my life and helped me become the person um, I became to be. Um, yeah, that article, Indiana Jones, there's some, there's, <laughs> by the way, those are great movies. It kind of dates <laughs> me, um, but for sure, great movies. Um, I think the Indiana Jones came from, I love school. I, I, I taught at BYU for over 10 years um, and I was always a part-time professor. And one reason, the biggest reason why was because I was so torn to being outside and doing adventures and then sharing those adventures in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so after teaching 10 years or so, 11, 12 years, I was like, I need to go back out and play and gather more research and bring those back to the students and, and bring back real life memories and stories of just living life and living adventure. And so I love the academic side of gaining as much knowledge as you can in life um, and sending it that way. But I'm an outdoor kid. So I, if there's a window, I'll catch myself looking outside of that window more than I am inside. And so that Indiana Jones part is, yeah, getting myself into wildlife or deep caves or on the tops of big mountains and uh, doing somewhat risky things. But I mean, I have four kids, so I try to tone that down as much as I can. Moderately risked. Things. Yes. <laughs> so do you think growing up in Provo, did you do, did you spend a lot of time in these mountains growing up? Oh, I mean, every day. I, my, my imagination was probably bigger than the geographic space of Pro, like Provo. Mm -hmm. Um the very first time, I think I was in third grade, where I started walking up Rock Canyon mm. by myself, because I lived pretty close to the mouth, about a mile away from the mouth. Okay. And uh, Rock Canyon is just here in the valley. And as I as I went up there, I just, I couldn't stop. I just kept going. And so I, I probably was born with some physical capability, because I was able to like go up there and feel comfortable. And I just wanted to go further and further. And I really believed... Like I was in a world of, you know, like Native Americans were going to be living up there and I was going to encroach on their territory. And I, even though I was on a trail, I mm -hmm. thought trails naturally existed to like point us <laughs> in the directions of, you know, the possibilities in life. And so I really came back with this journal. I always had this journal with me and I'd be mm -hmm. like, I think I might run into some Native Americans up here. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then I did learn that a few more miles later, I crossed like a road. I'm like, oh, great. Now <laughs> someone's been here in a car and I've got to go further. And so at a very early age, living right next to the mountain, I I was in the mountains every single day from the earliest as I can remember. And I was, I, I don't know, I think I was somewhat nerdy or um, I wasn't antisocial, but I was happy just being by myself. Mm. And probably half of it is because no one wanted to come with me because I was going <laughs> to hike all day. Uh, oh, but I was, I was 100% content being alone in nature and I welcomed any friends who wanted to come. But, um, yeah, in the eighties, it was a smaller group back then. Mm. Yeah. I can just imagine the magic of like going up Rock Canyon, like seeing those caves for the first time as like a young kid, it was probably like, what did I discover? Oh yeah. It was the world's <laughs> best playground, yeah. big rocks, tumbling rocks down the mountain. You'd get in trouble for that now. I mean, if you did that on social media. You'd, get, you'd be <laughs> canceled <up> overnight, <laughs> but rolling rocks around, picking up sticks, um, crawling in the caves. There's so many cool caves up there, um, cool places to ski and camp. And we have a ton of wildlife up there too. Oh yeah. Mountain lions, uh, bighorn sheep, mountain goats. I mean, it's a kid's playground. So right. I grew up right at the base of Rock Canyon. And so most of my adventures were actually started from right there. Yeah. I love your YouTube channel too, that like you have Mount Timpanogos at like every season. You're like doing something different, whether it's like you are skiing down the face of Mount Timpanogos or maybe you're like 
climbing right underneath it, kind of near Robert's Horn. You call it like Everest's Ridge or yeah. something like that. Um, I just think it's so cool that like in every season you find a way to like make these mountains. You know, your playground is cool. I I've been married for 25 years, and I tell my wife I have one mistress, and it's <laughs> Mount Timpanogos. Um, because I don't know, she's really pretty mm-hmm. and Gorgeous. really adventurous, and she's always there. Mm. When I show up, she's always there, and she's like it's very different at, all throughout the season. So it's one of the coolest mountains to ski um, or sled down if you want to, yeah. or run or hike or hunt on. It's just it's a beautiful mountain, and the front side and the back side are they're so different. Um, and through all the seasons, it's like she's really, really pretty. And so my camera is pointed at her quite a bit, mm. and. It's just been, yeah, it's one of those mountains I've grown to love. And I believe that, gosh, there's a handful of people who are like, yep, Matt knows like what he's talking about. Like I know mm-hmm. so many people feel the same way mm-hmm. because they spent time and had adventures and memories made on that mountain. It's yeah. geographically big too. I mean, it- Oh, it's huge. Yeah, it dominates the valley and it it's hard not to stare every once in a while. Yeah, I've seen a couple different videos that you've posted where you're coming at it from different angles and doing different things. I like myself couldn't have fathomed all the ways you could get up to the top of Mount Timpanogos and then come down like eight different ways you know, too. It's, <laughs> it's funny. A lot of people will ask me like, oh, I'd love to go backcountry ski there or hike up that route that you did um, or approach it this way. Like, how do you get there? Um, <laughs> w- which sounds kind of weird because I'm like, you're looking at it. Yeah. Um, just walk, mm. like grab a backpack and a water bottle and some food and a cell phone and just like figure it out. It's like there is some danger, but you, you obviously don't push your bounds, but just start walking. And if the brush gets too thick, go left or go right. Or if the cliff band gets too big, go left or get right. And eventually you, you can end up at the top any which mm. way you want to go for the most part. I mean, I don't want to speak for everybody because I have rescued a few people, um, on the mountain. And the good thing is, is most of them don't know who I am. So I'm like, good, I didn't get you into this. <laughs> so there it comes some good. responsibility. I hope in today's age, we're all aware that what you see, uh, you just can't get up and go and do on your own, but cause you could run into danger. But that said, just, I walked at that mountain and just figured it out a footstep at a time without getting myself in trouble. And there's so many cool things about that mountain and history um, with those who came through this valley. So there's fun stories, fun places to find water on that mountain, fun places to swim. Uh, yeah, it's just, if you've got time to go find an adventure, Temp will will be the place for that. Yeah, it's so gorgeous. Um, your first attempt was probably like hiking up it, right? I'm assuming yep. as a kid, you probably just hiked it. Are there any ways to like discover Timp anew that you like have in your mind that you're like, oh, this season I want to take it this way or this summer I want to try this? Or do you, like you said, just kind of like head up and see what happens? No, you know, as you usually one adventure leads to the next. Okay. Uh, it was kind of like a relationship with somebody like, mm. I don't know, you go out on a date and you're like, we, we don't want to do this again, do we? we? Let's try something new and go to a, try a new activity. And I feel like one adventure on temp leads to the next if you have a good time. Mm. But sometimes it could be your last time. and You're like, I never want to do that again. <laughs> so people have hiked it um, in August when it's like the hottest time of year. And then when it's packed with the most people and the least amount of water. That might be their last time they do it. But mm-hmm. every time I go up, I'll look at a new line to ski or a fun, you know, a ridge that would yeah. be fun to run down. Um, it's fun just to run the whole ridge of Temp, go up one side in the north and the south and run the whole ridge. Um, so usually there's the first adventure leads to the next. And naturally it just kind of came that way for me mm-hmm. of like, ooh, it'd be fun to go this way. And honestly, Temp minus the, some major cliff bands. Mm. It's a pretty like forgiving mountain. You can go just about anywhere. Most of it's above 
the tree line so you can walk in any which direction. And then when you get down to the 8,000 foot mark, it gets pretty thick with scrub oak, but there's so many, so much wildlife that there's always a side trail you can get through or whatnot. Let's not get people into trouble in this podcast and think they <laughs> yeah. can just go up there. Again, but... he's had to rescue people. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can get hurt for sure. I didn't, are you, do you do like some type of mountain rescue service or no. just because you have a helicopter? I do fly. I do okay. fly. And people are like, oh, Matt flies around all the time. And um, yeah, it just seems like when some people get in trouble, they're like, hey, do you know where this, my friend's been missing? Or uh, I had a friend up on Provo Peak who flipped a snowmobile on a blind date. And the snowmobile oh. kind of got totaled. And he's like, we're up here. We, we could call search and rescue, but I know you know where we are. Mm-hmm. And so it was really simple for me to just w- run down you know, the airport and be up there in 20 minutes and <laughs> pick him up. The, he didn't have a second date. Uh, yeah, that. it sounds like it was maybe the last one. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I saw you do like you were mountain biking down Provo Peak. What inspired that? Did you oh hike gosh. Provo Peak one day and do, you're like, I could bike this. <laughs> do not ride your bike down the face of Provo Peak. It's but if so you do, steep. it's full of screen. You will be a, with a small, you know, it's a small group of people who have done. In fact, I have never heard of anybody doing that. I've also never heard but of But I ran it so many times. I'm like, you could, you could ride a bike down this. You know, you could get some good <laughs> suspension on here and you could ride probably like 90% of this. And so, yeah, I... I did it one way by being dropped off by a helicopter and coming down. And then someone called me on it and said, you're cheating. You got to go up. I'm like, fine. So then <laughs> the next day I went up and the next day. put it over my shoulder and rode up to the base. But you really have to just put that on your shoulder oh, yeah. and hike all the way up. But yeah. It's like, I think it's three miles from like the base of it, right? Yeah. It's and like, it's just. It's 3,000 feet yeah. at least from the base. <laughs> if you come from Rock Canyon, it's 6,000 feet. So Yeah, and it's no, all it's scree. Yeah, it, it is. It is all scree, which is <laughs> so fun to go it was, on down It was, I rode it for sure, but it was mm-hmm. definitely like a 3,000 foot controlled skid, <laughs> you know, like with the brakes on just sliding down the mountain. So <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, I running down scree is probably my least favorite thing ever like I get to a point in a route that I like have to run down scree or like I've done some races where it's a lot of just like steep scree downhill running yeah and every time I'm like I'm never running again I hate (laughs) this I'm never running again and then I I find myself there well I think gators on your feet and the faster the better I don't know if that makes sense but scree you either slip or you just go so fast that it's kind of like an out of control slide slash run seems like that's the best way to approach screen. slide slash run uh, yeah I really like your approach to the outdoors and kind of the philosophy behind like why you go out there and why you post so much on social media um, do you want to speak a little bit to like what what motivates you to climb these peaks what motivates yeah, you to well I feel like the more childlike you are the more you enjoy being outside. Because like when you're five and six and seven, you never think, you don't put on a jacket, you don't care if you get muddy, you're somewhat ill-prepared, but your enthusiasm um, just for being outside and being playful is like dwarfs everything else, like discomfort or you haven't eaten food. That's like my kids now, like my boy's up skiing and he didn't eat food and he didn't dress properly, but he was so stoked to be up skiing mm-hmm. that everything else gets thrown out the door. And that's really like a big part of like being in the outdoors for me is you feel like a kid where mm-hmm. you can be yourself. Um, it's it's a it's a place to have free thought. Um, you feel pretty unrestricted. Uh, when you're with a group of friends, you you can <laughs> speak your mind pretty freely. It's like yeah. it's like a safe place and safe space for everyone to say, Hey, like, this is how I feel. This is what I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I also feel like nature, um, you're in a, you're in an environment that I don't know how to explain it, but it, the laws of nature are always, um, followed in nature. I don't know if that makes sense, but the, um, it's in complete obedience to the universe out there. I just feel at one when I'm in nature. Mm-hmm. Um, nature takes care of itself pretty good, and it's 
it's 100% in balance for the most part. And I just actually feel good when I'm, I'm outside. And in fact, I went, I remember just the humdrum of life was going on one day, getting kids out the door, paying bills, um, just the things that you got to do in life. I was doing in the morning, but I was going to make a run a part of my day. And I remember running up uh, Mount Timpanogos up the American Fork Trail, mm -hmm. up the American Fork side. And when I got into that basin, I just stopped. I was by myself and I was like, I feel good. I love this place. I said that out loud. And that's what naturally came out of me. And I think there's something that like your body's rhythm or something just calms down a little bit and kind of syncs up with mother nature and probably your heart rate drops a little bit, even though you are running straight up a mountain. I think your body relaxes and your anxiety kind of relaxes and your phone service dies a little bit up there and people aren't reaching you. And so I hope that most people feel at peace in nature. I think a lot of the reason people don't like nature, if they if they're part of that group is because they're uncomfortable mm. and they probably dressed the wrong way and, <laughs> or probably weren't properly acclimated to what they were doing. And so that might be some of the discomfort, but I mean, it's like skiing in like 505 Levi's on a powder day. You're going to hate skiing, but if you dress properly <laughs> and wear the proper skis, you're like, this is amazing. But if you wore jeans, you might, no, nah, it was just pretty cold and miserable the whole way. Mm. So there might be part of dressing the right way. But aside from like human discomfort, I think that most people just love being outside. Mm. It brings them back to maybe a place they remember before or feel at peace. That's, I don't know, that's kind of weird, but it's as simple as it gets for me. Yeah, so it's just like a, a pull you feel almost and the desire to just like be childlike and have fun and find yeah find joy. Like my boy, peace. my boy who is typical of all other 14, 13, 14 year old boys playing, you know, texting on his phone, uh, playing Fortnite. And you can see that, I mean, his eyes get twitching. He's like hungry and annoyed mm -hmm. and has anxiety. <laughs> and he's just like, somewhat agitated, highly irritable. And then I take him up in the mountains or mm. in nature or just take him skiing and it just goes away. Mm. It just like you get space, you start to breathe, you start to, I, I believe you're in a place where humans have been for a really long time until recently. Mm. And we're so distracted with phones and technology and maybe a little bit of politics in there and mass amounts of information coming in. We're just kind of, I don't know, we're, we're just kind of going crazy a little bit. And so it's fun to see as a parent, my boys, a, like personality change in about an hour after being outside, mm. everything kind of changes. So um, it's a good reminder for us adults, you know, to, to what that can do for us. Yeah, our, our last guest spoke to, she called it elevation meditation. And she spoke to just like how present you have to be when you're outside and when you're climbing things or doing outdoor things because there's rocks that you might trip on and there's like obstacles you have to overcome. So it just like pulls you into the present moment. And I think too, that's probably what brings us a lot of peace in the mountains is that we're no longer thinking like 10 minutes ahead or like two days ahead. It's like, oh, right now which is cool yeah absolutely yeah. that's true that's true um one thing that i think is cool about you is i feel like there are two types of like athletes i'm really generalizing here but one type really gets into the nitty-gritty of like okay i need 35 grams of carbs this hour and i need to have this type of carbs and i need this many electrolytes and then there are athletes of the category that I kind of feel like you fall into, which is like, I want to have fun. I want to see like what this day brings. And I'm just going to like do my best to see what the mountains have to offer. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. You're, you're right about that. I, I kind of agree with you. There are those two types of athletes and they're mm. both great. Um, one has a very specific goal in mind mm. possibly. And um, they're driven by numbers can be a fun game for some athletes. And yeah get their pace down to a certain number and they're highly driven by, you know, but maybe a time they're looking for. I, maybe I'm just too old to get in this game. I just love being outside. Mm. And so someone's like, I mean, I do have nice gear, but I don't care. I don't care what gear it is. 
I don't care what my pace is. Sometimes I'll like run like a 13 minute mile and I can run a six minute mile, but I don't even care. And I won't even know till, mm. I mean, halfway down, I'm like, we're going really fast. I'm tired. <laughs> and I'm like, like it's probably going to be a fast one today, but I am. Yeah. I'm not driven by, I think I was saying earlier, if someone said, if you run every day, studies have found that you'll continue to gain a few pounds each year by, um, you know, exercising, I would still do it. Mm. You know, I'd probably be 200 pounds and be like, <laughs> sorry, I just got to keep running. It's, <laughs> it's so, so awesome. Mm. Um, so I'm driven. My motivations are quite a bit different. And that's just to decompress for the most part, uh, be with good people if I can, and be in a really pretty place. Mm. And I feel like that combination, I, I come home really happy. Mm. And um, thankfully, it may be a pound or two less. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but that's that's my real motivation is just to get out and be in nature. Um, but yeah, the speed of the day is not important. Whether I make it to the top, it's nice to make a goal and keep it. And we'll usually make that, but I'm so happy just to turn around wherever or get completely distracted. And if somebody's like, this isn't the plan. And I'm like, I know we, we had to come out with the plan mm. to start the day together, but it doesn't mean we have to finish that way. I get, I'm like a Labrador retriever. I'm, I can get distracted very easy like, and okay. start going. And that's probably why I figured out a lot of the nooks and crannies of Mount Timpanogos is, I mean, I'd like to go to the top, but you see a cave or an animal or some water coming out somewhere, some bright, shiny thing catching your attention, I'll go walk there. And so it's more about the overall adventure for mm -hmm. sure. How do you feel like that bleeds into your family life? You've, you're you pretty vocal on social media and stuff about how much you like love your family and prioritize them. So how do you bring them into this? What role do they play? You know, my kids are... My wife's really pretty, which makes my kids super gorgeous. Mm. It has nothing to do with me. That helps because mm. I'm like, I want to snuggle those babies. They're <laughs> cute. But I, I've i just loved kids from day one. Mm. My wife works so hard. Like the mothering is like a full-time job and it is like stressful. Mm. It's not fair because I feel like dads just get to spoil the kids and play with them and I, I feel like that's been my my job. I don't know if I've done it right, but now my kids have been the best part. And I love sharing stories at the end of the day with my kids and places I've gone. Um, and they each respond to what I do um, differently. And mm -hmm. I'm totally okay with it. I have, I have two kids that are 100%, I want to be just like you, dad, and hang outside and do everything. Uh -huh. I'm probably too protective because I'm like, you can't do this. It's too dangerous. <laughs> like, I don't want my girl to fly helicopters or planes because I'm like, mm. this is too dangerous. And I don't want her to backcountry ski because I don't want to get them caught in an avalanche. But mm. riding horses, I'm okay with. Trail running and hiking, I'm okay with. Uh, but the other two kids, they're a little bit slower to like gravitate towards the outdoors. Mm. And, I'm, and I'm totally fine with that because we're not all the same creature. Yeah. Um, all I care about is that they are passionate about something, something that they love to do. And so my my boy is starting to get into skiing, but he loves art and he loves drawing. Mm. Um, and I see him kind of like light up when he does that. So as, as far as my kids into the outdoors, the ones who are signed on to what I like to do, I'm 100% like any what? day I'll take <laughs> you anywhere. I want to keep them safe. I'm mm -hmm. probably way too protective. Um, but at the same time, I have a daughter um, who just moved out of our house when she was 18, right when school was done. And I pictured her just like going to her apartment and hanging out with her friends. And so like the second day she was gone, I called her on the phone. I was like, hey, mom and I are going out to eat. Do you want to come with us? And she's like, oh, I'm surfing in Malibu, though. I, I can't. <laughs> I was like, like totally taken aback. I'm like, wait, not sitting at home. <laughs> how did you? How did you get how did you get there? And she's like, Oh, I just drove. And I'm like, who drove? Like who knows who knows the way down there? She's like, I just drove myself. I was like, You took your car down to Malibu? Like, what, what if you got hurt? And she's like, I knew you were gonna say that. So I just wanted to call you when I got here and I could tell you I was safe. Mm -hmm. And I was like, 
okay, well, what are you doing down there? She's like, I'm surfing. I'm like, you can't surf. Do you know how dangerous <laughs> that is? Like, there's like, I'm surfing. You what? could drown out there. You could hit a rock. You could get tumbled in the waves. Mm. Like, there could be a riptide. Do you even know how to surf? She's like, yeah, dad, I know how to surf. And it was like, oh, I'm looking at myself mm. in the mirror almost, and I'm not accepting it. But I, I, so I am a little bit worried, but she's totally adventurous like that. Mm. Just, you know, like her spontaneity and drive for adventure is out there. And my youngest girl is the exact same way mm. that she just, she's a little daredevil and I want to be protective, but you got to let your kids, like I say, find their passion. And once they find it, like be their cheerleader for mm. whatever that is, as long as it's a positive thing in life and, yeah. you know, gives back to the community in some way. Like if it's all about that, then I cheer them on no matter what that is. Yeah. That's awesome. How do you feel like you make time for your family? You, It seems like you have so many things going on. Like I could talk to you about a million different things. Well, but... I technically, I would say I'm retired Okay. now because I invested in my family company, mm -hmm. which is totally boring. It's like real estate and mm -hmm. it's not even fun to talk about because it has really nothing to do with me. <laughs> but um, I always have to get my kids to school. Mm. So I have... I have oh, my cool. my kids need me in the morning mm. and my kids need uh, my wife. I am happy to wake up at like three in the morning, four in the morning. Waking me up for life is not hard because mm. I feel life is really short and I feel like I recognize that and time is like gold to me. So I don't like to sleep that much because I'm 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 afraid <laughs> of the, you know, the sand falling through the hourglass mm. and I want to soak it all up. So I'm usually the one up to get the kids up to school mm. and get them out the door. And I also want to be there to pick them up because I, I feel like the most crucial time for kids that, you know, that are my, my kid's age from 12 all the way up to 20 and up through those ages, if you can get them right after school, it was important for me to listen, like mm. be the biggest ear I could so they could decompress talk to somebody, make sure they were safe, feed them, and then I can disappear again. So um, if I'm there in the morning to read with them, be there with them, and then pick them up from school and then put them to bed, I feel like those two times in between, like that's where I go and adventure the world. And you've got to hit it really hard and fast. And what's lucky for you and I is that like the mountains are sitting right there. Oh yeah. They're Can you like imagine if you had to drive away. like an hour? It's like two hours out of your day that you don't have just to sit in traffic or drive. So I live on the mountain. So once my kids get dropped off, I'm usually dressed in something and run straight up the mountain from there. Mm. So, and then you pick them up for carpool. Mm. And it makes you kind of fast too. If you want to be a fast runner, just like have a <laughs> carpool fly. waiting for you and you will like, you will make such good time. You will speed down. And the you will get a couple tickets too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I kind of want to pivot to your TV show. Um, you have this great YouTube channel and Animal Planet, right? Looked yeah. at it and tried to pick it up and turn it into a TV show. How did that happen? So I did like somebody's not gonna like this. Someone's gonna hear. I did a YouTube about every adventure of my life. Mm. Then I found out through social media that there are some things that I do that not everybody loves. One is I eat meat and I like to hunt. Okay. And I love the idea of like, let me just go get my own meat. I'll go take yeah. my bow and arrow. But it's just like this world is very touchy feely these days sometimes. And I'm like, okay, you guys don't like that. So, but I did actually start Matt in the Wild, which was a YouTube channel mostly of running slash running around with a bow and arrow and, you know, hunting and, hunting. and getting things like that started. So that, do you exclusively hunt with a bow and arrow or do you? No, I'm, okay. I'm up for like, some people are like, wow, like you, would you actually shoot with a gun or something? Like, is that fair? I'm like, it's more fair than going to McDonald's and getting a number four. Yeah. Like, um, and I do eat meat and I've accepted it. And I actually went into the hunting world um, with no bias one way or the other. Yeah. I just hadn't done it my whole life until I was 30, 30 years old, 40. Mm -hmm. And my neighbor is like, hey, do you hunt? And I said, no, I don't. She's like, would you like to? I'm like, sure. Mm -hmm. 
Why not? Sure. I'll tell you how I feel. I'll tell you my moral compass, what happens to it. Mm. And um, yeah, I went hunting with like a bow and arrow for like two, well, about a month. Um, and it was really, really hard. And I actually ended up just hiking my butt off, like up and down oh, yeah. the mountain. And it was the hardest thing ever. But when I did actually shoot a deer and then like bring it home on my back and feed my kids, I was like, this doesn't feel wrong. Mm. This, this feels good. Like I've, I probably got here to where I did in Provo by somebody in my, you know, ancestral line doing the exact same thing. Mm. And it just, it felt okay. And it tasted good. And it was really hard and it wasn't easy and it challenged me. And I used every part of that animal and I'm like, hey, this is okay. So that's how my YouTube got started by doing outdoor adventures. And then I had a friend from high school who was up in Salt Lake who said, we need to do a TV show of this. But mm -hmm. maybe just maybe just focus on one activity that, you know, maybe you're outdoor running. Mm -hmm. And so he pitched that to um, Discovery and like over dinner, they bought it. And we ended up running. I picked two of my high school buddies. Um, they said, take a couple people that you'd like to take with you. You guys film it and we'll drop you off anywhere you want in the world and give you a camera. And you got to run a hundred miles each time and mm -hmm. over three days and then just see what you can come up with. And it was awesome. And it was super hard and it was super challenging. What you don't realize on the show is that you don't get to see a lot of is the camera in her hand. Oh, yeah. And like five batteries on her back and like a mic pack. And so and then running, setting up the camera and running by it and then going and picking up again. So we ended up running over 100 miles each time because I could never I wanted to make sure it was 100. Yeah. But I couldn't guesstimate how many back and forths we would be doing while filming. Yeah. So it was really hard. Um, I was hoping that the world would find the the magic of trail running and the freedom of it and how laid back it is and just fun it is with your friends. Um, well, it's like hiking, but three times as fast. Yeah. Um, and so you can get to see a lot more of nature and go a lot cooler places, I think. Um, but the show ran for a season and it honestly did not do that well. Really? Uh, this is, this is what's kind of fun about it is I think, I think we took over my cat from hell. Um, okay. <laughs> and from Animal Planet. And I think I think all of a sudden maybe some our audience all of a sudden got shifted. Mm. And I think all of a sudden there was like teenage looking boys running around being 12 year olds. And they're like, what is going on here? Where's my cat? And it help? didn't quite pick up. But I knew it was for somebody out there. Yeah. Um, but I think they maybe marketed it wrong. We still all love it. I have all eight episodes, but it plays all around the world still on reruns in Mexico, uh, in Italy, in France. And I actually was on like a cruise once and I was watching TV. I'm like, oh, there I am speaking Italian. Like it was, hey. <laughs> it was awesome. So, but yeah, that went on for one season and then mm -hmm. I was exhausted. Like mm -hmm. it was so hard. It took a lot. I did not like being away from home Yeah, um, for my kids. And my wife also said, I don't want America's entertainment Mm -hmm. to um, have a conflict with like your safety. And I don't want your safety to ever go second behind someone's entertainment. And so, yeah, I kind of shifted some gears and backed off in life a little bit to be like, you know what? I got to be here for my kids. I invested mm -hmm. a, a, a lot more time in that. And maybe backing off a little bit from my crazy adventures, not a ton, yeah, but a, a little bit. But of like kind of the structured TV show. Yeah, it was it was hard putting together a Hollywood crew um, yeah. and have them follow around some Utah boys. Um, we all got along because we, we giggled and laughed, but trying to like let them know how, how hard of a thing we were doing because um, they would just show up, you know, at, at the end points. of each day or three days and be like, how was that? Can you do some extra shoots and run up this mountain? I'm like, we are so dead. I'm going to fall asleep for a week. <laughs> Do you want to see this? GPS? And we ended up doing post-production stuff and running past things. And it was, became not as fun. Mm. So. Yeah. Just being married to my husband, he does film. Like 
I never understood what went into the production of even like a documentary that's yes. like very rudimentary. Like watching your little like TV show, I was very impressed at all the shots that you got, how you were able to document it so thoroughly and it like made sense watching it. And for me, when I'm running, I like to focus on the trail. And when I try to focus on like filming it or like capturing the beauty or like the difficulty of the experience, I can never do it. So like that aspect of like that's another talent that you and your it's, buddies have is that you were able to capture. It's an art. You have to have a yeah. storyline yeah. always in your head of what's the goal? Where are we? Where are we going? And along the way, what are the obstacles? And explain those before they come, if you can. If they just happen to jump on you with no warning, explain what's going on. And then to explain how you got out of that. And 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 so there is always a storyline and it becomes an art and you can become really good at it. And to the point where you can actually just have your adventure in a day mm. and have not that be not not have it be distracting. Mm. You know? The first time you were like 16 and you drove like a stick, you know how you were like fully engaged and you're like, I have to just do this. Eyes laser. But now like road. you can be drinking like a drink and then like I'm not gonna say texting, but you could be texting. Mm. And totally distracted. And someone's like, do you know what you're driving right now? And you're like, yeah, I can do that. I mean, I can do mm. that without even thinking about it. You know, I feel like that's what filming was, is we could almost tell a story and carry those cameras because we were so used to it that it just became second nature to be like, yes, there's cameras, but we're still living in our adventure, running how we run and whatnot. So you got into the flow of it and it got Yeah. And it easier. is a skill. You just kind of learn it and... You, you can do it with, you don't think, I mean, you can drive up to Salt Lake probably and have a conversation with your husband mm -hmm. and drive the speed limit, obey all the rules and actually forget about your whole drive back. Oh, you're, we're here. Yeah, you're like zoned out. <laughs> so that's how kind of filming it was towards the end. So, yeah. Yeah. Like even in the first episode, you guys ran out of water and had to go find water. Like yes. In kind of near Timpanogos, I think. I don't exactly remember where, but like unless you've experienced running out of water on a mountain where it's like well is there six hours to water oh, so <laughs> is bad. there 10 hours to water i don't know like you don't know how a scary it is b like the physiological effects that it has on your body like you're tired your heart rate shoots crazy high you can't get it down even if you're like sitting there and you're cramping and yeah, yeah, the perfect run is um, finding the perfect amount of water along the route. <laughs> yeah, and, and usually when I do big, long cross-country runs, it's a game of where are we going to get water. And mm -hmm. if you can connect the dots with water, you've planned a successful run, in my in my opinion. Yeah. So what do you do on big ski days when you're out there for the whole day? Do you try to pack all of your water? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's easy in the winter because you're not burning like... It's yeah. so crazy. Like in the summertime, I'll run a mile and a half mm -hmm. and I'm like drinking half a water bottle. Yeah. But in the wintertime, backcountry skiing, I've honestly gone all day long <laughs> and I'm like, I did not touch my water bottle. <laughs> did I even drink that? Yeah. Every once in a while, like if I'm going through like a burst of, you know, aerobic activity, I'll just reach down and grab some snow. Mm. It, it, it probably does no help for the body, but <laughs> yeah. mentally it's like, but honestly, for the most part, backcountry skiing, you can take a water bottle and you can go mm. all day long. It's totally fine. So you feel fine. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, have you had any experiences this last year that were especially difficult or that you like maybe hated in the moment, but really loved looking back on it or loved in the moment and love looking back on it? You know, well, I, gosh, I've been doing this for my whole life. It, like second, third grade, just walking out my, and then it, I was doing big stuff, you know, so easily 40 years now. Um, and I've kind of ex just accepted like some, you have good days, you have bad days. Um, it's never fun at the start, but it's always worth it at the end. Sometimes it's fun the whole way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, those those years, those, those were in the early years having those. And I, if someone got started into running, 
yeah. and they came with me, I'd be like, oh, they're going through, <laughs> they're going through these phases now yeah. of, man, I hated waking up early or it's so cold. I remember running with one of my buddies who was actually on the show mm. and he's like, he was barely starting into trail running and like five minutes into it, he's like, I hate to say this, but my feet are wet. <laughs> and it was so funny because I was like, okay, <laughs> yes, yes, your feet are wet. He's like, what do I do? And I'm like, you do nothing. Mm. It's, it's like a new mom saying, I'm tired. And you're like, mm. yeah, well, you're going to be tired for the next 25 <laughs> well, years. Congrats. The whole time you'll be tired. <laughs> and so you get used to these things of living in the outdoors. Of, mm -hmm. You're always going to be sunburned no matter how much sunscreen you put on, mm. you're always gonna be dehydrated and you'll always be hungry and uncomfortable and itchy and you'll go through every physical discomfort, but then those just kind of go to the background and you start living in the moment and enjoying like where you are and how unique it is that you have time to be in the mountains. Um, and so at my age now, my this last year to get back to your question, I am starting to feel old for the first time. <laughs> and I like, I I don't ever, I haven't had a big injury ever, a huge mm -hmm. injury. I've crashed my bike and broken bones yeah. and whatnot. But for the runners, I try to take care of myself the best way I can and, and back off when I feel like I could be getting into an injury. But I feel like I'm getting, it's harder for me these last two years to get out and wake up each day. The motivation is like falling back. And I'm not at the top of my game every day. It's just, mm -hmm. I have to fight really hard each day to get out there. And I'm like, am I really five pounds heavier than I've always been? Like things are creeping up on me. Mm -hmm. And it's making the game fun again though for me because I'm getting into these later chapters of how can I gracefully get old <laughs> and enjoy the game at the age you're at um, and it's actually been really fun for me because it's been really challenging of maybe I can't always eat what I want, which is donuts, pizza, and Coke, mm -hmm. like 24 seven. Maybe I should make some life adjustments there. And um, I don't recover as fast, um, but I'm loving this time because it's a new chapter and I'm, I'm moving, I'm gracefully, I feel like moving into these you know, older, wiser years of being in the outdoors. And it's kind of fun where I find myself backing off from, should we just ski this for fun? Or should I go off that cliff? I'm like, you know what? Actually, guys, <laughs> this would be a bad place to get hurt. Um, and it's cool to not have to be cool all the time. And mm -hmm. I'm kind of enjoying that. I'm trying a new thing of no caffeine mm. at all. So it's been like almost a year. I feel like I gained some weight with that. Mm. I talked less in the morning when we were running. And now my friends are having fun on this caffeine high and I'm watching them. I'm like, this is what it looks like to be on caffeine. And I feel like I'm the sad person at the party <laughs> who's not joining in the caffeine kick. But I'm only doing this because I can't sleep well now, mm. the older I get. So I'm actually sleeping really well now that I've been off caffeine for a year. And it's kind of fun getting old and learning all parts. It's fun being cool and being like the star of the show. Mm. And it's also fun slowing down a little bit and enjoying, I don't know. I feel like I'm sitting at the restaurant for three hours now and enjoying the meal rather than getting in and getting out of there like a 15 year old kid who has endless energy. Mm. So yeah, this last year, it was my, the last couple of years, it's been my challenge of, is staying motivated to get up early, go do big miles. And the good thing is I still am. Like I haven't yeah. slowed down, you know, yeah, my, I'm probably a little slower than I was five years ago, like speed wise, but I haven't slowed down going out each day. Mm. I'm out there every single day doing something, but it's just, it's a tiny bit slower pace, which is kind of cool. So do you feel like when you wake up, do you need to motivate yourself to get out there? Or I, is I it like- I totally do. Like okay. I will have some friends who I will, I will fish with texts in the morning. Okay. I will send out these texts to be like, what are you doing today? Mm. Um, hey, what are your thoughts on, do you want to do this? And they'll say, maybe I don't want to do that, but I would do this. And I'm like, that works for me. I'm a little bit more flexible. Where in okay. those, maybe 10 years ago or even five years ago, I would say, I'm running tip, 4 a.m., <laughs> meet me in the parking lot if you want to. Regardless, I'm going mm. and I can't sleep because I'm so excited. 
to get out and I have no motivation problems. All I want to do is be outside all the time. And now I'm like, it's so cold out there. <laughs> yes. And it is early and I'm getting hungry on my runs. Um, but I'm still... I'm still working through it. It kind of makes it a new challenge for me and I mm. am getting out each day. So I'm finding what works and that is making my plans a little bit more, less spontaneous and just, hey, tomorrow, this is what we're going to do. Let me get my clothes ready for it the day before. Mm. And um, yeah, I just need a little bit of motivation. Caffeine so can motivate people, but it hasn't been working for me lately. <laughs> Caffeine is the best. I probably need to cut back myself. But um, do you? So you feel like you're kind of relying on the circle of friends that you have and then maybe just the desire to like keep momentum going to is what it sounds absolutely like you're friends are the best tool i would say if you want to get fast if you want to have fun if you want to get out and be consistent pick a friend who has those same goals mm. and commits to those and you will get out and you will have fun and your motivation will be there and so picking the right friends is probably the best way to get out I would also say as I'm getting older, I don't like to put all my eggs in one basket because mm. I've done that in the past where um, my very first Wasatch 100, I trained like I was so fast. I was going every day. I was in this. And then uh, I was running with my buddy and he kind of clipped me on the side of my knee, mm -hmm. knocked all my cartilage out. Oh. And two weeks before the Wasatch 100, I was told, you know, got an MRI, showed me all my cartilage floating around in there. And he's like, don't even think about it. I still went and I tried and the pain was mm -hmm. beyond the first mile, the second mile, the third, till I got to Brighton after 75 miles and I just collapsed. My knee was so swollen and <laughs> it's so- like bursting through your pants. Yeah, it was, it was, it was absolutely awful. Um, but I learned something in that. And that is when you put all your eggs in one basket, you can set yourself up for- like like a tragedy mm -hmm. almost. It was so hard mentally to be like, this is, did not just happen. I, my mm -hmm. whole year was for this. And so the whole next year I had to mountain bike mm -hmm. every day, but I did sign up for the Wasatch 100 and, and ran it with only like three weeks of training before and running. I'm like, okay, <laughs> That's awesome. my knee's been good. I've been biking. Let me go. I have three weeks. Let me go do three like 25 mile runs and see mm -hmm. if I can do that. And it was fine. I think I had stored up in the bank so much, mm -hmm. you know, Just cardio, yeah, fitness, that it was, biking. I was ready to go. And it was, and it was an amazing run. But as I get older, I know that I'm not going to be a superstar in any of these sports mm -hmm. all the time. Like there's the young kids, like my nieces and nephews are so much better than me at skiing. Like they'd go do a double backflip. And then when they don't <laughs> land it, they bounce like a rubber band. I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm not that guy it. anymore. <laughs> Um, so I've tried to like diversify, uh, mm. my, you know, my outdoor portfolio. And I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go learn to fly a helicopter. And if I can't go ski up 10 runs today and figure out where the snow is good, I'm going to fly around and see what run is good. And I'm going to spend all my time there and, and maybe, you know, just try different activities. So flying became later in my life, something that I wanted to do, um, and riding horses, fishing. I know these are like, ooh, that's not, you know, that's not it's hardcore, fun. but you got to have a plan for retirement mm. and to get yourself. Otherwise, you're one of those angry guys who gets online at night and tells these kids, when <laughs> I was your age, I was doing this and this isn't safe. You just always want to be 100% in the game for your ability mm. at that time. And I love seeing that. Running is what's awesome about running is. I swear, like I ran with my neighbor till he, the Wasatch 100 till he was 70. Mm. And I was like, if I can do this when I'm 70, one of my best friends is, you know, 60. Yeah. So um, I know, and he's amazing. He's like stronger than me in so many ways. And he can actually take a hit on the mountain and bounce down and recover. And I'm like, okay, we, you know, like you can do this. But I think as I get older, I'm having a, I'm having a plan for the later years to, get me to the finish line. Cause I think you mm -hmm. can be uh, an endurance athlete till, till the very last days. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole definition of endurance, right? Is like, you want to do something at a pace that you can do forever. Find the friends who match your ability to, and you'll stay mm -hmm. sane. Cause mm -hmm. if you keep hanging out with those young kids, 
you're just gonna feel worse and worse. <laughs> but pick your friends, Stay get old them. together, uh, okay. and then you can complain about the same things on the mountain, your knees, your lower back, mm. being dehydrated, how hard it is to get up. Mm. Uh, I Yeah, pick your friends wisely. You wanna all be on the same page. Otherwise you just, it'd be really, yeah, it'd be a tragedy to hang out with 20 year olds your whole life. I mean, they might make you feel young for a while, but then eventually you start feeling bad about yourself. And sap all your energy. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, so do you get out with your same friends still? I do. I have, you know, with social media, it's kind of fun in a way because you can meet so many people and I love people more, more than I do the outdoors. Some people like the outdoors a lot more than they like people. And that's why they, they might yeah. like the outdoors. But I love people. And I like hearing their stories, you know, their politics, their religion, their joys, their sadnesses, their trials. I'm really just a people person that listens while we're doing something aerobic a lot of the time. And I have, yeah, I have kind of my groups of friends in the certain areas that we do things like, Guys that like to ride horses, guys that like to fly, um, guys that like to just trail run. Some guys just mountain bike and they hate trail runners um, or vice versa. But mm. I've got all my friends in my groups and there's a lot of them that overlap. And I don't have a lot of friends. I have about five really good friends and mm. and it's good to be with them because you guys have shared stories over. And it's kind of fun to have friends where you don't need to flex all the time. Yeah, It's like, I know I'm fast. I know you're fast. I like you. You like me. No, we don't need to race to the top of the mountain today, right? Yeah. <laughs> but when you get out in these groups, everyone needs to, like a racehorse, they need to prove themselves in their pecking order. And I'm like, I'm so old for this. <laughs> I, I can't have, I've run with some young kids and they're like running as fast as they can. I'm like, I can do this, <laughs> but I don't want to do this. And every once in a while, I'll have fun and send it really hard mm -hmm. and put them in their place. But I actually just <laughs> like to be with my guy friends and talk about that my kid had a hard time going to school today because he had anxiety. And I'd rather talk about that at a 12 minute pace mm -hmm. rather than running at like a seven minute pace. And I can't talk about anything and I'm seeing stars. So there's a time and place for everything. Mm. Yeah, all of this that you're saying to me bleeds like passion and enjoyment and just like, making the most out of the time that you have, which is kind of like the theme of what you've been talking about. You said something as you came in that you feel like your space in kind of like maybe teaching and your space in like the internet community is to show people that anyone can do whatever it is that they want to do. <laughs> yeah, well, I would say I don't know. I've, can I have a question for you? Yeah, totally. In your podcast, um, what are people coming to find with you? Like, what are they? What are they looking for? Like, what? What? Everyone's either you know looking to get information or to be entertained. Like, how is your your audience? Explain your audience how you might see your audience, what they're looking for, and and what it is that you offer them. Yeah, like I I heard a quote. Um, from an ultra runner a while ago. And she said that she hoped that everyone running the ultra race would do their very best so that they could push her to do her very best. Yeah. And I just think that like having an online space of endurance athletes or just people that enjoy the outdoors and we're outdoor sports where they can have a space to talk about how they do their best. Yeah. It would probably inspire others to also apply some of those things and also do their best too. Good. Well, I I think that this might go really nicely with your view, like those who listen, your listeners. Do we call them viewers or listeners or both? I don't know, both. <laughs> well, I would say this, um, if they're listening. One is you really can do anything that you want. I don't want to sound like, you know, over the top or cliche, like, like I've heard that before. You, I am living proof. I am very, I'm a very average person. I think the only thing that sets me apart maybe from being average is that I don't have a lot of fear of what other people might think of who I am or failure. Um, maybe that chip is missing in my brain, which has been nice 
because everything I've done in my life that I'm really good at now, I was very average at to begin with. Mm -hmm. And most people wouldn't have hired me or bet on me or any of that um, in my early years. Like running, for example. Mm -hmm. In seventh grade, when I went to run the one mile, I was wearing, it was, remember we start school in August, that our coach wanted us to see if we improved over the first day and the last one. So it's 95 degrees in August. I'm like wearing a sweater. I don't know why. I wanted to look good on my first day of school. And I was wearing like, I was wearing like Timberland boots and I was wearing some like corduroy pants and I was wearing some reindeer sweater. I got, I got a sweater <laughs> on today. And I went and I ran the mile mm -hmm. and I was the, I was horrible. I was so hot and sweaty and my lungs burned <laughs> boots. and I was very average. If I, if, they, if I got a grade, it would be, Matt, you got a B minus or a C in your one mile run. Okay, like fast forward through time. If, if I would have just listened to see how I felt then, I, I didn't care where I was, but I loved it. I was like, I know I'm not very good, but I don't care. This is what I want to do. And fast forward to, you know, running 100 milers, 100 Ks, 50 milers, mm -hmm. doing a TV show about running 100 milers. Yeah. All I do is run and I'm really good at it and I can compete on any level. And I came from nothing and I didn't have, I mean, nothing set, nothing makes you a great runner than just going out and starting to run. Mm -hmm. I mean, the best and the worst, you can be like, yeah, I have a $150 pair of shoes. And I'm like, well, I have a $70 pair of shoes. That's that's the discrepancy like between the, you know, the nice best equipment. <laughs> it's like, you just got to get out and run and nothing kind of set you apart that way. But I just went and did it. And um, with school, I was a very average student. Like seventh grade, I was a C student. And I didn't care, but I loved learning. Mm. And I, that's what I loved to do. I loved books. I loved reading. I loved learning new things. And then I just kept going and got my PhD when I was like 24 and taught at BYU. Like I was a really young kid doing that. And I shouldn't have been there, but um, it's with everything I do in life. Flying scared me. I was not a great pilot at the start. It scared me. I, I remember there was a horrible story about my best friend, Rob McDonald, who was my instructor, was teaching me. And after like my 10th attempt at landing an airplane, like right in the middle, right before I'm about to set down, I bounce off the runway and I throw my hands up in the air. I'm like, you got this. I'm giving <laughs> up. And he's like, whoa, you can't let go. He's like, what? Oh, that. Like, I was that guy. I was very average at everything. Mm -hmm. And so I want your viewers and listeners to know that if they are passionate about something, it surpasses any skill that you might have. Um, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it or have not been doing it or how old you are. You can do whatever you want to do and be good at it. And I just feel like I'm living proof of that. I was never exceptional at anything, but I'm pretty good at a lot of things. And it's because I love to do it and I just keep working at it. And there's nothing amazing. Like if, if you were a human being and you look up to another human being, well, you can do what they do. You're the same creature. You're the same animal. Uh, there's nothing extra special about them. They just, they just got to it, put their head down and started. And so if you want to be a runner, be a runner like right now, like you can go buy a shoe, pair of shoes for miles or wherever you want, put a pair of shoes on and just start running up Provo Canyon or run up the mountain. And I guarantee by the end of the year, if you keep at it, you will be a great runner. So I want your listeners to know that there's nothing special about the big guys out there. Mm -hmm. They were all beginners. They all started. They just loved it. And um, if you love it as much, you can be just as good. So, Yeah, I think that's an amazing message. And I hope that if someone listening like thinks that they maybe can't do something or have always wanted to do, to do something but have not had the confidence or like the self-belief to even try it, I hope that they can hear what you're trying to convey and kind of feel the experiences that you've had throughout your life and like take the courage to go yeah try to do it and the the number one ingredient is like passion just to mm -hmm. like it if you if you hate something you'll either be keep doing it and be good at it but be angry the rest of your life but if you love something you don't even care if you're good 
Mm. Like you'll just keep doing it because you love being out there. And, and I love being with those people who are passionate about something because yeah. it number one, it's contagious. You can get it real easy. Hang out with somebody who loves something and you'll want to hang out with that person again and mm -hmm. do that activity with them. So like be true to yourself. If, if you hate running um, and you've given it a good shot, like you do have to try something for an extended period of time. Yeah. Because I can say you could probably hate running for a small period of time. And if you do it enough, you'll end up loving it. Mm -hmm. But so if, if you want to go that route, you're like, I want to be a runner. I don't like it, but I love who these guys become mm -hmm. or um, what they're doing or how they look or how they feel. Then I applaud that. Like get on that wagon, try it, give it an honest effort. Uh, but if you, if you've given it an honest effort and you don't love it, man, like try ballet, like mm. go pick up a, a pencil and start drawing something or getting in an aircraft and start learning to fly, like find everyone's good at something. And so, so there are some people who are listening to this that it just, they weren't born to run. Yeah. Um, and, and they, they're not going to like it and it will never get better and it will always be painful. Um, and we might not be looking for these people, but what I would be saying to you is you are so good at something, find it. And that, I, that's what I love about being like kids these days or and even like if you're 40, I didn't start flying until I was, you know, 40. Mm. So at least helicopters, I just was having a bowl of cereal one day and I was like, I'm sick of being <laughs> an airplane pilot. My brother's cooler than me. He flies airplanes. I want to do, I mean, helicopters. I want to do that and just started doing it. It's never too mm. late, but you have these hidden Easter eggs of talent hidden somewhere in the universe and you got to go find them. And you just got to find out what that is. Mm. What are you thinking about at night when you're trying to fall asleep? Like if you're a teenager and you're thinking about a girl, well, probably time to pick up the phone and call her. Mm. Uh, you know, that's, that's what you're passionate about right now. If you don't want to go to school and you keep thinking about, you want to do a backflip, you know, I mean, parents don't listen to this part, but don't go to school, like go up to Sundance and get that backflip done. Like mm. follow, I feel like your passions are like these small whispers in your ear um, that it wants to try something and you and you go and you do that. Um, so follow your passion, but you gotta find it. It is like an Easter egg hunt. You've gotta look in a lot of places and is it running? Maybe, maybe not. Is it backcountry skiing? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, is it weightlifting? You just gotta go find it and try a little bit of everything. Um, I would say try the good things in life that make you a better person and mm -hmm. add to society as a greater whole, but look for that. And you are going to be good at something. You'll be passionate and you'll be the best at what you do. Thank you. I think that's such a crazy, valuable message. And thank you for sharing so much of your own passions and how you've like learned to lean into the things that you love and, lean away when you need to and lean into something else when it calls you too. I think that's really inspiring. So thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking time to come. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks.